welcome to Read, Return, Repeat. So this is our first official episode of season four. You might notice a few different things. Uh, We are doing our intros video style. If you're Um, listening on a podcast app, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed, (laughs) except that we're more fun. So yeah, I get yeah. I think this is I think this is cool. It's like Regis and Kathy Lee or whatever. Oh, except or like Huda and Kathy. Lee. <laughs> I can't keep track. That's wine of them. though. That's wine. We don't drink so, it <laughs> So um, this is our fourth season, and this mm-hmm. is our first official episode. First official episode. We had the kickoff. Yeah, and that which was is fun. great. You did that was a fun time. What did you think of it? What'd yeah, you I uh, you know I always feel like. My book choices aren't as cool as everybody else's. Do you uh, ever feel that way? Like, yeah, sometimes I would. <laughs> would that be yeah. imposter syndrome? Yeah, I read a lot of graphic novels, so that definitely it's like, oh, you guys are talking real books. <laughs> <laughs> Although you were very uh, intimate, uh, intimate? No, we, you were not intimate. But you were very <laughs> animated about uh, the DJ Khaled. Thing. Oh yes, I, yeah, about. yeah. The DJ Khaled was one of my picks for. Yeah. I basically was able to take DJ Khaled's book and apply it to like every category. That's true. There are so, a couple. No. A recipe book. He's not. Didn't a have a map in there. it. There was a there was a line on the cover, so I felt like that was close enough to count. Like, <laughs> oh no, it was like a map to your success or something like. Oh yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, we, we, yeah, we were able to find it apply to most okay. of the categories. You anyway. don't have to relive it. If you want to know more about DJ Khaled's book, go check out our first We have episode. talked about DJ Khaled on this season way more than <laughs> we should have. We should have. But anyway, um, so it's. I thought we'd have to start off with a game. Okay. And this game is called Four Square Squared because it's season four. Did you write this game? I made this game, yes. Okay. Um, season four. 2024. 2024. So it's like, like four squared, squared. Which, uh, what, what I'm going to do is I will read you four excerpts. Okay. And every book is the fourth publication from that author. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So I'm not going to know. I'm going to be horrible at this game. First one. Okay. Whipped cream isn't whipped cream at all. If it hasn't been whipped with whips, just like poached eggs, it's a poached eggs unless it's been stolen in the dead of night. Uh, Mary Poppins. All right. No. Close. You're in the right. Okay. You're in the right realm. Okay. In the town, there was no sadness and no sorrow and no poverty either. In the town of the happy little workers. Is it Roald Dahl? Close. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're getting closer. Is it Willy Wonka? Yes. Didn't even need four of them that time. The schnozberries taste like schnozberries. Yes. It's going to be the fourth one. So, so last one because we have to start the show. Yes. She always had the feeling that it was very, very dangerous to live even one day. I don't know. Go to the next one. For Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges. Rumpel Mayor's men were coming. I don't know. All right, this next one, <laughs> I hope you get it. She, because it has a title in the quote. Okay. She had the oddest sense of being herself, invisible, unseen, unknown. There being no more marrying, no more having of children now, but only this astonishing and rather solemn progress with the rest of them up on Bond Street. This being Miss Blake. Not even Clarissa anymore. This being Miss Richard Blank. Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Okay. Uh, oh, no. no, you have to guess. I, that's the author. Oh. Virginia Woolf. Come on. Oh, Come Mrs. On. Dalloway? You got it. I okay. hated that book. Half credit. <laughs> Half credit. All right. Maybe. You know what? That's fine. Let's move on. All right. I got it. I get okay. the points. Next time. You better watch out. <laughs> Yes, is a winner of the Penn American Literary Gene Stein Award. Do we even say who it is? It's Frost Gay, everybody. Let's so yeah. excited about it. Um, he's the author of four books of poetry and the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Book of Delights. 
and then he just came out with a sequel yes. a book of more delight so uh we talked to him and he's out of in bloomington indiana where he's an english professor so let's go ahead and jump to that interview um but first let's also just mention we did not talk to him about the book of delights we talked to him about inciting joy yes which is an awesome read so yeah let's sit hand it over to past versions of ourselves and in fact ross gay Thank you so much for joining us today, Ross Gay. We're so excited. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. Yeah, um, glad so, to be here. So tell us about the book. Um, I know that this is not your newest book, but we wanted to talk about inciting joy today. Um, why did you choose the word incite as a way to describe like creating joy? Hmm. There's like a handful. That, that book had several titles actually kind of in the process. There was a a riff on a Chris Hedges book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Meaning. So I was sort of thinking, oh, joy is a force that gives us meaning. But that felt a little too kind of spelled out in a way. And then there was another one. Um, oh, what was that other title? It's a riff on um, Went Free. It, it was one of the titles. And it's sort of like a riff on an, uh, an essay that I wrote about my friend Patrick Rosal's comments on uh, dancing. Um, but then then I just sort of thought it might be neat to, and then I thought, oh, joy, a, provo a provocation or something like that. But there was a book that was sort of similar in title. And and I, so I thesaurused it and the word incitement came up and I was like, oh, that's the exact word that I mean. And when I say that, I mean all of the things that incitement sort of, um, sort of uh, makes you think of, you know, the incitement to unruliness or, um, you know, shaking stuff apart, um, be, you know, because in a way like the, I think the premise or the theory or the exploration or whatever, the query of the book sort of does suggest that joy is this thing that is in fact sort of um, disruptive to a certain mode of life, which I would call a mode of unlife. I'm saying joy is a kind of uh, disruption to the brutality. Um, it's a, you know, that we might call a kind of standard living, you know, um, what we have to survive. So joy feels absolutely like an incitement. It feels like a kind of ripping apart to get to, toward what we know how to do, you know. It does kind of feel like an act of rebellion almost. I mean, it's been, you know, a couple rough years, I think, for everyone. And to be like, no, I'm going to just like create these things that bring me joy. I'm going to create joy. I'm going to incite it. Um, feels like just rebellion. And so I actually had to look up incitement because I was like, that seems like a weird choice of words. Yeah. And then as I was continuing to read the book, it was, I just kind of like sat in that moment where I thought yeah. about it. I don't know. What did you think, Daniel? Oh, I, th I think it's like inciting. I kind of like from an old, like, it kind of seems like, we do kind of have a ritual way to to bring joy into our life, and like I, when I think of incitement, I think of like like occult stuff, like inciting, like like kind of like ritual to make something happen. And so like it's like we do that, like like think of all the things you have to do to go to Disney World to experience like like not maybe like very manufactured joy. So like no, I like I kind of got those vibes from the book. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. The, the word inciting is both a um, verb and an adjective. I like that too. So that. So it asks the question, how do we incite joy? And I guess it presumes that we might be able to incite joy. Joy is a thing that you can incite, but also how is joy inciting the description? How, yeah. how is joy itself inciting? And I think sort of like my, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, but like my understanding or thinking right now about joy is that it's fundamentally about how we care for one another and how we practice that care. It's fundamentally about and I had to write this whole book to sort of figure this out, which might is going to continue to be figured out for the rest of my life, I suspect. But it's fundamentally about the practice of our entanglement, the practice of our belonging to one another. That's what I think joy is. And so when we join with that, when we enter into that or submit to that or whatever the word is, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, the potential for a kind of radical care is is a, or that's what we're submitting to, the potential for a kind of radical care, or maybe even spotting or noticing when we're in the midst of such care, you know? When we do that, it does it does something. I feel very, very confident that it does something. 
that's yeah i um so I, I, you kind of talk about sorrow in your book and your book opens with an extended metaphor about bringing the personification of sorrow to a gathering and how sorrow brings people together the incitements or chapters are all about the things that bring you joy and some of them are really heavy how does sharing sorrow bring us joy well, I think that one of the things that I, um, and this, you know, I'm kind of indebted to many people. One of them is Zadie Smith's beautiful short essay called Joy, but also all kinds of other writers and thinkers. Some of them like, you know, Buddhist thinkers, the writer and uh, nun, uh, Pema Chadron is one, and um, there are others. But to me, the feeling, my feeling is that one of the ways that we, enter into joy or commune with joy or or you know you can tell like I'm, I'm always trying to figure out like what is the thing that joy is or does or we do with joy but whatever that thing is one of the ways we arrive to it or commune with it or whatever is um when we help each other carry our sorrows you know which is why like um um funerals memorials etc are sites of joy, you know? It's not like because we're we're full of sorrow or because we're longing or because we miss someone, the joy is not there. In a way, the joy feels more acute in the midst of knowing that someone is no longer with us, you know? And it feels like that, that's one of, you know, the first essay in the book is sort of like meditates on my father's, you know, death from liver cancer. And it's sort of like the reason to put that up front is because I sort of firmly believe that there's something about the closeness that that illness happened to occasion between my father and myself. Like his being sick led me to get closer to him, led me to be softer toward him, led me to sort of like understand him in ways, which is ongoing, that um, that otherwise, you know, there was a closeness that I don't know otherwise would have happened, which is not at all to say it's not also devastating, but the devastating part of the devastatingness is um, that it also brought us very close to one another. Yeah, I mean, the it, it's a weird juxtaposition, right? Like sorrow and then this like, what brings you joy? And when you were talking about funerals, I was like, oh yeah, funerals we do like, cause people will go and they'll share their memories and we call it a celebration of life. Yeah. Um, and there's still, I mean, I've been to some funerals that were just like devastating and sad, yeah. but then you do like with your community kind of try to hold on to those memories and share the things that that were happy. Um, so, and, and, I mean, and just say, and I'll say even, because it's so hard to sort of parse out, but I'll just keep on sort of suggesting or offering that it's not a, um, it's not a juxtaposition but it's that okay. it's a kind of tangle to get. That's my sense. Like I'm not imposing anything on anyone else. You're <laughs> the professor, this, so that's great. Bring <laughs> barely, <the> barely. <laughs> it's a kind of entanglement. The joy, joy does not exist absent sorrow. You know, there isn't joy without sorrow, you know, which is partly why it feels important, like the personification of sorrow in that essay, why it's important to bring sorrow into the room. You know, once sorrow, you know, if we hold sorrow out of the room, we're never also going to um, know the fullness of joy. We're never going to dance together like we could. We're never going to tend to one another like we could. We're never going to like look after one another like we could. We're never going to share like we could. If we don't, you know, if we don't realize, oh yeah, you're dying and you're dying and I'm dying. Now what? You know, for one thing, let alone the fact of like our heartbreak and let alone the fact of our sort of daily sufferings. Um, let alone the sort of fact of our suffering connected to all of the suffering, you know, simply that we're all going to die. If we if we forget that, <laughs> you know, um, one of my yeah. um, uh, one of my I have like this is probably disclosing but I have anxiety and like a lot of that is about death and so like in the midst of a panic attack I like think about oh everyone's dying or whatever and so one of the things I've been having success with is like realizing that when those thoughts come up, they need to come out. Like, I, and I can't yeah. just repress them all the time and to like kind of welcome them and be like, oh, we're thinking about this now. Yes. And like, it's, it's, it wants to sit at the table because it's tired of being locked up in the basement all the time. Totally. And like, and like looking at though that, those anxiety, those anxious thoughts, those like intrusive thoughts like that about just like, oh, you know, like you're, you know, like your dog's 12. You don't have that many more years and stuff like that. 
like when those come up, it's like, oh, it's just because you don't like thinking about it all the time. And so like, yeah, I kind of see there's an entanglement there. Like for me to enjoy life, I kind of have to also be, you know, like I can't just lock all that away because because I feel better after. And I think that's kind of like the, when I think of your entanglement, it's kind of what I think of and stuff. Well, we've always totally. considered it to be a juxtaposition, right? Like two opposing values. Yeah. When, so anyway, just radical yeah. thinking all the way through. <laughs> Well, when I was, um, I've also, and you know, suffered from like anxiety, paranoia, you know, the number, of, whatever these head, <laughs> <laughs> and partly it was precisely that, precisely the the desire or the need to hold out to like keep all kinds of feelings out, among them sorrow, for sure, among them heartbreak, but also among them like, yeah, the fact that we are changing, that we are not always going to be like this, that this will not always be like this, that, you know, that our bodies are um, temporary. And and it's so interesting to hear you say it because that's my experience too, the, like one of the great lessons, however it came, it probably came by being like, in a mindfulness meditation class at Thomas Jefferson High uh, Hospital, and by reading, you know, the the nuns and the monks who I mentioned, and uh, everything else. But to be like, if you hold that out, if we hold that out, we're gonna die. You know, like my brain is gonna explode if I can't also attend to my heartbreak. sounds like that's your experience somewhat too yeah yeah it's like I yeah I feel like that's what happens is it's like you like you can't yeah you have to like embrace it at some point like you can't like I don't know I just I you see like especially with the older generation you see people have repressed their emotions their whole life and it's like you don't want to be like that like I'm sure everyone has like an older relative that you're like they because society conditioned them to repress their feelings and things and you're like yeah and so it's like that's what I always think of is just like seeing like an older person frustrated at Dylan's and you're like that's because you like you're conditioned to not like <laughs> so it's like I don't want to end up like that so yeah yeah and yeah and there's versions of myself that I become acquainted with periodically and I'm like oh that's not um that's not really being alive <laughs> you know and so I encounter those those folks inside myself and I'm like ah you need to soften up <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know what you're saying. So throughout the well, throughout some of the first chapters, I remembered seeing this um, this phrase "remembered to us" instead of like "reminded us of." Right. So especially in the chapter with your father, um, and then throughout the book, and even in this interview already, our words are your your words are very intentional. Um, and so I wanted to know, you know, where did that "remembered to us" come from? Is that something that uh, well, I don't know. Just tell us where yeah. that comes from. Talk about your choice of words there. Yeah, I hadn't, you know, it's funny. I hadn't thought of that until you mentioned it and I couldn't remember where I had written it. Um, <laughs> but now when you say it um, and I think about it for a second, I think probably that way that that, um, the syntax of that, it's weird. It's a weird thing to say. It's something that's been remembered to us um, is part of the, it's sort of, Part of the linguistic, I suppose, practice of uh, um, or or inquiry around joy or whatever, but the implication is that <clears throat> it's not it's not it's not just us. The implication being that these are things that are given to us, you know. Mm -hmm. The implication being that we're in a kind of network, um, and even our memories, not even our mem memories, are among the many things prominently is our memories are given to us, you know? And so that, um, and so, you know, the way that the sun, as it starts to, you know, set low or, you know, move lower through the sky, remembers to us some things, or the way a conversation with your mother or the way she looks falling asleep can remember to us certain things, or um, or a dream can remember to us. It's just like the, to me, it's, I think it's probably a way that I'm suggesting that um, even our memory, which we, like to probably think of like our memory is what distinguishes us from other people. It's in fact how we are. The, it's more evidence that we are other people and other everything's. It's more evidence. Our we are memory. Not ourselves. Say it again. Yeah, 
I said, it's our memories. Like, you know, that's my memory of this thing. But what you're saying is you're kind of turning that on its head and saying like, because we were together when that memory was made, now you're giving me that memory. And so- Yeah, totally, just, totally. I think that's so many... as beautiful and just like a strange way of looking at it, but I really like it. Yeah, I mean, I, how many times I'm with my mother who's 82 now and like, and I'm, I'm sitting with her and she remembers something that I don't remember. And I'm saying like, that's an instance of something remembered to me. Or recently I've been um, visiting, seeing my Aunt Butter who's 96 or something now. And she's remembering to me things that I don't know. So she's remembering things, which now become part of me. You know, remembering things about, say, the the way our origin stories, you know, our our generations previous to her. Um, remembering things in her life that feel absolutely the way that my life has come to be or will come to be. Um, she's remembering it to me. I was always told I was in a hospital when I was like six months old or something. And like, uh, I recently went to like, a, it was like, I recently went to the hospital, like the hospital system that had that file. And it's like, I just always told that I was like, I was six months old when this happened. And then I was like looking at the chart mm -hmm. and like, I saw it. Like I saw this like thing that had been told to me my whole life. Uh -huh. Like, oh, you were like, and I saw, I, there's the first time I ever saw any kind of evidence that I was actually hospitalized before I could remember anything. And I was, I've been like resonating on that a lot because it was like one of these things that was told to me and like whether it was true or not or like what happened or whatever but then seeing like the hard data of it wow. like like kind of brings like and so like I've been thinking about it's like wow that like you always heard this story and you kind of like when you're like listening to a story from your mom it's like you you take it from like a different perspective than when you see facts about yes. things and things and it's just yes. been kind of like and that's when the remember to us kind of reminds me of that hospital experience. I'm talking a lot about a lot of trauma dumping. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're just talking Honestly, about life. I feel like your book was one big therapy session, <laughs> yeah. though. You know, it felt very like because it was your stories, but it caused a lot of self reflection. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Good. Uh, and and kind of in that same vein, and you were just talking about you know your family and your ancestry, and and in the chapter on gardening. I'm going to quote this because I really liked it too. Uh, whoever saved the seed loved us before they knew us. And then how that garden archives that love. Um, talking about the seeds that you're getting from all of these different people and family and uh, Mr. Lau, the neighbor that you had. Um, I thought that was just a really beautiful story and a really beautiful way to describe something like seed sharing. I mean, libraries mm -hmm. are doing seed sharing now. So it's just this yeah. uh, special way of looking at it. Um, and we consider gardening to be this very solitary activity, right? You talk about going out, drinking your coffee, talking to the plants. Sometimes I do that too, less the coffee, more the talking and like mm -hmm. encouraging them to grow. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. But in this way of looking at it, you know, nothing is, is self-sustaining, right? It, everything needs another piece. And that's a very long way to say why do you think we have to look at this at the world this way? Um, especially because, especially in this country, we're very individualistic, right? We are constantly thinking about our own little bubble, but through gardening, you're making this argument that we need to be mindful of all these other ways that we're connected. Yeah, um, and I'm, and I don't, you know, I think one thing is that I don't like, I'm not imposing a mode of life. I'm just sort of wondering about things. Um, so I don't think anyone should be anything. Um, I'm happier <laughs> when I, um, the evidence seems clear to me also that when you walk into your garden, like you were saying, when you walk into your garden and you encourage your plant to grow, you're not by yourself. You're having a conversation with this, with this being who is also having a conversation to you. And who, say, if it uh, is a pepper plant or a tomato plant or a collard plant or an okra plant, will eventually actually transform your body by becoming your body. So it's not even like you have to like get real heavy about it, right? <laughs> it's just like, you're not actually alone, you know? And there's someone else who could say all of the things that are in the air. There are many things, but some of the things that you can see are like the honeybees and the mason bees and the little green wasps that look like flies and the flies and the, <laughs> the worms and the beetles and the gnats and the da 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 So that it's like, oh yeah, it, what a sorrow to like have a uh, like a shrunken notion of what we is, you know, 
in the garden, I think if you're like a decent gardener, you know, if you're not like a kind of murderous gardener, <laughs> you you are required to be like, oh, right. When I, you know, not only to like ask the plants kind of what they want by observing and sort of listening and paying attention, but also to be like, oh yeah, like you all really kind of get along. So like, let's grow these close to this. And like, it's kind of cool how you can, you know, the, the beans can grow up the sunflowers. You know, I've been like harvesting the, pulling down the beans, dry beans we grow. And there, we have a lot of like sunflowers planted by, you know, us, but also by like goldfinches and stuff. And it's so beautiful to me that they're like all these gigantic, you know, they're kind of like scarecrow sunflowers and, um, and also castor beans, which just arrive in our garden. A lot of them are grown up and kind of like, they look like Christmas trees with um, dangling, with beans dangling from them, you know? So part of my harvesting thing is to like pull the beans off of these, the remnants of these uh, sunflowers. To me, it's not a leap to be like, we're in a collaboration and the sunflowers is, are every bit as important to that collaboration as I am. And the sun is <laughs> really important to that collaboration. You know, it's just so nice because I think you're exactly right. I think it's an absolutely an American mythology, a fantasy, a brutal one that imagines in, in kind of a whatever uh, valorizes or whatever the word is that means lifting to the gods, that notion of the individual self, but it's just like, it's a lie. And in order to sort of maintain and preserve the lie, we will brutalize everything, including the earth. You know, we'll beat it into, you know, into submission, but you can't do that actually. You can't do that. You just beat yourself into submission. <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. I mean, it just, it's sometimes hard to look outside of yourself, but yeah, I think we're better people when we do. Probably. And I probably feel like there, too. there was a, a lot of reminding of that in your book to mm, look outside yeah. yourself. Yeah. And happier and happier. Yeah. It's just like a nicer yeah. life to walk around and be like, hey, you need anything? And also to be able to be like, yo, I need something. That's just like a happier life. And to be like, mm -hmm. damn, I have all these needs. And here it is. I am in this garden and this garden attends to my needs. And then there are people who have like preserved these seeds of these plants that I love. And they've been doing this for like hundreds or thousands of years. This is wild. I am like buried in care. <laughs> Speaking of which, yeah, I got to run the bathroom. Thing. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Run the bathroom. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah of course. Okay. And you feel free to leave that in the podcast. I'm, uh... <laughs> you know what? Let's just take a break real quick right now. Yeah, we'll take a break. And then uh, when we come back, we'll jump right back. Okay. No All problem. Right. Oh, oh, be right back. Did you know that the Wichita Public Library offers a large selection of digital magazines for free? They are easy to access and are now available to you on the Libby app. You can download Libby from your phone or tablet's app store, sign in with your Wichita Public Library card and start browsing immediately. Magazines can be found under the guide section on Libby and include popular magazine titles about news and politics, cooking, celebrity news, healthy living, and more. For additional information on Libby, please visit wichita.overdrive.com. All right, and we're back with well, Ross Gay well, yeah. on Read, Return, Repeat. So it's so awesome to have you. So um, in your chapter, Out of Time, you say we are cogs in a machine that won't stop in service of productivity and capital, and our time doesn't belong to us anymore. How do we stop the clock, make time our own, and find the joy that we deserve? I don't know. <laughs> that seems like, like a really said. loaded question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I said, I don't, I'm not real sure about... I, I don't think like, I have answers, but I have a lot of questions, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, but I do know there's like sort of very practical things, you know, that um, um, when there are very few people who have all the money and they can make everyone else do kind of whatever the f they want to survive, you know, whatever they want them to do to survive when they control that is um that is uh, that is a challenge that is an impediment <laughs> you know what i mean um yeah that, yeah i should have said like uh outside of like complete class revolution <laughs> yeah <laughs> well I, you know, that kind of stuff uh, <laughs> and um i don't know what do you all think 
what are the moments or the instances where you sort of feel like you're in a, have a different relationship to time or something like that? Uh, yeah, so um, I feel like when I'm with my dog, is that cheesy to say? Like, I feel oh. like going and I don't know, I've been thinking a lot about self-care. I also just read an essay about it last night while I was um, getting ready for bed uh, by yeah. Phoebe Robinson. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but um and she wrote about self-care and how it's this like multi-million dollar thing and so we find the things that bring us joy anyway it has nothing to do with my answer for this but <laughs> um just that I've been ruminating on this concept for um now a little while and I know that when I go and see my dog she brings me these little moments of joy and it's like pure yeah and then I don't have to think about what else is happening the cogs, the machines, the time yeah. that's creating the anxiety, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Totally. I uh I do a lot of like meditation. Like that's good. Like yeah. I do, I mean like I, I well this is like a really like I guess to answer the question, like so like uh because it's like the weird thing is I don't know, I feel like it's really hard to detach from time. Like, it's really hard because, like, I'm actually one of those people that knows what time it is without even looking at the clock. Like, I have, like, an internal clock. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. within two to three minutes, I can always tell you the time, no matter, like, I don't know. It's, like, uh, but, like, um, but to, like, break away from just, like, the the rat race or whatever you want to call it, it's, like, I just, uh, I kind of, okay, I, this is, like, I, I do like delve into fantasy like I daydream a lot I'm an active daydreamer I create like subplots and never, like, I don't think I've told them no one knows but there's always like ideas in my head like about like I don't know like I just can like sit there and then all of a sudden I'm in like a mechanized space marine suit and I'm like thinking of this big narrative space opera mm. and I've had these op these like fantasy like, I've been daydreaming my whole like since like I, as a kid and these like I will like come up with new ones. I'll come up with a concept. I don't like write these down or anything. They're just kind of for me. Yeah. These stories that I can like switch on and just like live in that world for a bit. Whoa, that's so, amazing. That's really yeah. amazing. And just like yeah, think about it. Those, that's, I mean, that that's like neat. Those two things. One is uh, the imagination and the other is um, close relationship, you know, ways to interrupt or deal differently with time. That seems... That's my experience too, I'd say. I mean, you know, <laughs> like when you're deep in a conversation, you're having a different relationship to time. My experience of gardening um, almost always is that I kind of fall out of like conventional time or whatever we call it because, you know, I'm I'm utterly distracted and I'm utterly like, I'm both utterly distracted and I'm totally like, whatever the word is, like focused at the same time, you know, like I'm way into what I'm doing. And then like something happens on the other, I just see a glimmer of like a zinnia and I'm like, oh, I better go look at the zinnias, you know? <laughs> and before long, it's like two hours have happened to the thing that I came out in the garden to do, got halfway done. And then, but I feel like my relationship to that kind of methodical, whatever you call it, um, is really changed. Like garden, um, um, conversation, um, playing basketball for me, play, actually, play. Um, maybe more when it's proper play as opposed to competition, probably. Um, it's a good question. You know, it would be useful. I know people ask this question and I and I am frequently enough like, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> then it would be a good thing, you know, to like have a, have like a thing that we write together, like a big old, like a chalkboard. There's like things that, change our relationship to time or whatever the thing is slow time down or disrupt or you know destroy time I don't know. my friend has been obsessed with this facebook group called the view from my window and we've been talking about it she's really heartbroken because now they're monetizing it and they're doing the view from my window cruise and like but she was like getting a lot of joy from like well, maybe we don't need to. oh it was just like people would like take pictures from their window from all over the world oh uh, mm -hmm. And it was like a really awesome thing, but as it goes on, it be it kind of gets caught up into the mechanization of capitalism and everything. And but like, so it's just like this was she's like I like it's I feel heartbroken because she really enjoyed this Facebook group and kept sharing it with me and just like the simplicity of it. But now it's just kind of like what happens when something you know catches on and like yeah. loses its heart or whatever and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. So um, you have a very literary sense of the wor world. Um, and in your book, you were talking about like Richard Pryor, Luther Vandross, who I, I know and love, uh, mm -hmm. Mark Gonzalez. No idea, but I got your like admiration <laughs> of him. Um, and you regard them in the same sense that we might regard, and you even quote uh, like Whitman and Auden. Auden, is that how you say it? Auden. I'm not sure. Auden? Yep, yep. Okay. Um, so my question is, do you really see poetry all around you? I mean, even in your in the way you talk, I feel like your mind just kind of has that lyrical sense. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, do you see poetry all around you? Do you see the world in poetry? I don't know in if words? I... <laughs> I wouldn't say that, no. But I think I have like a, maybe um, maybe what you're saying is that I have, um, and I think this is true, I have a highly sort of referential way, like associational and referential. Like I can kind of see connections between things. I practice doing yeah. that. Um, and I think that's kind of something you learn by maybe writing poems and maybe inclines you to certain kind of poems. Um, but I'm also like constantly thinking of, this reminds me of this and this reminds me of that, like in a kind of literary slash as you say, like Richard Pryor slash music slash um, whatever kind of way. Like I, you know, I feel like that's how I think. I think through like, um, I think through but, the stuff that has taught me how to think really, you know? It, it's like pattern seeking behavior. Like yeah. you know, intertextual, I think is a term like I learned in like my English school, like English uh -huh. program. Uh -huh. Like yeah, yeah. is that in like, but, but yeah, like why, that's what I liked about your book was that it's like, your thought process was very intertextual, but it's like, that's how we think as humans. Totally. Like, it's not a concise narrative. It's like, we're we're referencing everything. And time. also like, I was just kind of, I was kind of reading some of the stuff this morning. I didn't catch, you had a Charles Bradley re reference, which oh, I, yeah. yeah, oh my, his music was amazing. And oh my yeah. God. So beautiful. yeah. So beautiful. Yeah, there's something kind of really pleasant, like fun to me about a kind of rambunctious, you know, I write about it, but like a rambunctious citationality, whether or not you're being like, hey, I'm, this is like a Luther Vandross reference or not, you know, <laughs> if you make it someone who knows Luther Vandross might know what you're talking about, you know, that's then that's who you're talking to at that moment, you know, like I if someone knows Taylor Swift, I don't know Taylor Swift's music at all, but if someone reference, you know, said like one, she has a famous, sure she has a famous lyric that like all Swifties would know. And if someone said it that, in the presence of people, a handful of people would be like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. And some of us wouldn't. And that's like, cool, you know? And it fires synapses. Like I hadn't thought about Charles Bradley in a minute. And then I, like, yeah. I saw him, I got like, I got like, I saw him in live at Riverfest one year. And just like, like just hearing like you reference changes. It's like, I, I could hear him singing that. Like, and like, um, and I think it was like, I really liked that, especially with the comedy stuff too, is just like, yeah. It fires those synapses and activates those old memories and stuff. I really liked your concept of the in the chapter on covers, mm. uh, or the essay on covers, where it was yeah. like, if this person did this cover of this person's song, and and I so it got me thinking of just different covers, and then I can't remember any of them that I thought of in the moment, but yeah. I was like, oh yeah, oh that would be cool, and so it's just a fun little mind journey to go totally. on. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a good thought experiment. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of other versions. What did I say? I was talking to someone recently writing about it and that the opposite, there's some kind of opposite way. Oh no, it was, um, so in the essay, I talk about what would be, who would be good, like um, unlikely covers, like in the, I start off with the Michael Jackson song, She's Out of My Life, which is kind of a teeny bopper, like a kid song, the way he sings it. But like if Charles Bradley sang it, so different or if Bjork sang it so different or if Nina Simone sang it so different yeah. and then I started thinking about well what singers would be what pro basketball players you know so like who would Charles <laughs> and that's Bradley? where you lost me but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> etc you know those kinds of games I love those games I was good with sticking with music but it was yeah, yeah, yeah. no I really yeah. liked it see we so all got our record <laughs> uh in the in the chapter for or in the essay free fruit for all you talk about your experience planting a community garden you write about the work isn't necessarily for you and those that organize the project because we don't know what the future holds but now we we're 10 some years into it how is the orchard doing and are you still involved 
I'm very loosely involved. I mean, I might be on the board. It's like that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I go over there and uh, check it out every once in a while. And I'll chip into it like a work day here and there. Um, it's going well. You know, it's sort of, it's taken off. The trees we planted, you know, are, you know, you usually plant like a two or three year old tree. And so they're like, you know, 13, 14 years old. It's wild. Um, but I think the, in addition to the orchard itself being like, you know, carrying on and doing well. And, you know, I just was at a reading the other day and someone, um, young woman from somewhere around here in Indiana, but not right here, um, was getting her book signed. was like, yeah, I was just in Bloomington because I was doing a tour of the orchard because we're starting a community orchard in our town and we wanted to. Okay. So that to me is like, oh yeah, that's good. That's good news. Um, but equally good news is that the people who I was friends with, who I made, became friends with, uh, during the process of that are like still absolutely beloved beloveds you know and the woman who started it she lives like right across the street more or less you know and she was just here um working out with my partner like actually while this was going on you know and and, and we like share our lives you know like we we they she and her crew have a garden and we have gardens and we share each other's gardens and we take care of each other you know try to help each other out and um, and there are other folks from that community orchard project that are like that. And so I would say it's it's thriving. It's thriving. Yeah. And I love... It's a cool concept. Oh, it's a great concept. And yeah, I love that every time I see Amy, who's, you know, like, it was her idea. You know, no idea is only our own, but it was it was her idea. It was a, an undergraduate thesis project that she that she wrote about first, and then she kind of drummed up support and then she would kind of the whatever led the thing until it became a little bit more quote unquote organized which it didn't really become for a while <laughs> uh, to be able to see her and always be like oh man you like totally changed my life for the better god damn that's special yeah although you were describing the meetings that you guys had and i i wouldn't consider myself like a type a person but i'm definitely like a okay, what are our action steps? What are we doing? How are we doing this? And um, those meetings sounded like they would stress me out. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And they were sort of, this was like a time situation, actually. Yeah. The but I mean, it's situation. beautiful. I wish that I could just like unplug myself and just enjoy those moments. Yeah. Um, but I recognize that about myself. And it, maybe it's a reminder that I do need to slow down and just enjoy the the community that comes from such a project. Yeah, or or even like to know that um, whether you enjoy it or not, because the, the, the meetings were entirely enjoyable. They were many things, you know, <laughs> um, and sometimes they were annoying and sometimes they went on like plenty of us probably at different times were like, this is going on too long. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but partly that kind of weathering that or whatever the term would be was how it was the inefficiency actually that made the love grow in a way. Yeah. You know? It's like. You know, I was at a reading once and someone said, asked this question, there's a reading in Minnesota, in St. Paul, Minnesota, and someone from the audience who was a farmer said something about efficiency, maybe asked me to talk about efficiency. And together we got to this thing, which is something like, the question is, is efficiency ever not brutal? Does efficiency ever not cut off care? Hmm. Not that efficiency can't also make more care possible. But does efficiency ever not come with the price of care? Some care is going to be sacrificed to efficiency. I think it's a really good question. And sort of like, which is why hanging out purposelessly is one of the ways that care kind of happens. But when you only have 15 minutes and we're going to be on the clock and like, oh, okay, see ya, see you next time. <laughs> you know, you got to like get the care in. Sometimes it's hard to do. <laughs> Rapid care. Rapid care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But like, also, like, you have to get stuff done. I don't know. Totally. I, I see exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And I think there has to probably be a balance, right? Yeah, you have to sure. have the care with the efficiency. Yeah. So. yeah. And the thing that I sort of mentioned in that essay is that, you know, like three of those, three of the eight or nine people who are on the board at least had little kids, mm -hmm. you know, who, you know, so those people are tend to be a little bit more <laughs> time constrained. And they had people looking after their little kids or sometimes their little kids would be at the meetings and we'd all be kind of looking after them, you know? Um, so it's like, 
it's like the, in a way, like the inefficiency was tended to by other people taking care of some stuff. And that also feels very important that it was never sort of like we were doing this. It was like, oh yeah, the reason we were able to go slow was because other people were kind of looking after the stuff that we had to make sure we could got it done, you know? As is always the case, you know, it's always the case. I think that's just kind of the whole communal concept that like, I don't know who said it, but people say that we're like, humans are not supposed to live out of anything outside of a village. And so like mm -hmm. in cities, basically we build our own villages kind of thing and stuff. And that's kind of like what it reminds me of. It's like, yeah, do right. that. Totally. Like, yeah. But also it takes a village. <laughs> it yeah. does take a village, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, your, so well, your essays will start with one thing and then hop over to something completely different. Uh, for instance, the skateboarding incitement starts with a story about being in couples therapy. Uh, I liked it because I felt like it caught the chaotic nature like of life in those. Like I feel like that's how I like think and like get to stories and why I tell stories like those roundabout ways. Uh, does it, does this reflect kind of how you see the world? Like just kind of like. I just like that your your writing isn't just like co like it's not like concise. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like how it's just like I like the structure a lot. I, I liked how it was like when I was reading on the school thing, like how we talked about Melville for a second, and then it, it totally related to him. So so I just didn't know yeah. like yeah, is it the whole intertextual thing too? Is it just kind of like how you examine the world? Like I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's like there's a way that that's absolutely the case, and I like that actually. It makes me think, oh, there's something inefficient about these essays that I that I adore. <laughs> like, I like a kind of inefficiency. And when I'm reading an essay, sometimes that feels very efficient, like it kind of knows its moves and it knows where it's going. I can feel um, less interested, you know, than a than an essay that feels very much like it's figuring out where it's going. And the way it's going to figure out where it's going is maybe it might be like couples therapy, blah, blah, blah. And then I thought of skateboarding and then skateboarding and then, you know, from skateboarding to like other kinds of things, you know, family, et cetera. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, it, I'm more interested in my thinking when it's like that, as opposed to like, like a kind of more uh, um, impositional thinking that I sometimes think, you know, like, like I'm imposing my ideas as opposed to like following them. And I almost wonder if I could even write like that anymore. Like when I try, when I feel like I have a thing that I need to write, I really struggle. I really have a hard time. And I know it's not good writing. I know that. But even like when I have to have to get it done, I'm just like, I'm kind of miserable, you know, but I'm very interested when I have no idea where it's going to go and I'm going to kind of follow it. I'm very interested in in the writing that comes out of me in that case whether or not it's writing that i keep i'm very interested in it i kind of like the concept in the chapter on school or the where you talked about uh unfixing yeah with the workshops and things and just kind of like that approach to writing and things because it's like uh like for me like making it like it's it's easy to be like with writing things like having it be very formulaic but it's just gonna like to get something done and like, but the thing about that is, is like when you when you kind of use like these concise steps, I think of like the whole like uh, Blake's Beats for Screenwriting, which is like this book about how to write a screenplay. And like, I was reading criticisms about this book because people saying like, this book came out and the mediocrity that came out of this like screenplay writing format and things. And it's kind of like, you have to unfix, like to be a good writer, you can't be like, you can't just follow the steps to be a good writer. You kind of have to unbreak it. So anyway, that's, yeah, I like that chapter a lot. Yeah, I mean, but also you can't, I mean, to be a reasonable person in a relationship, say, you can't just follow the steps. You can't know everything. You have to ask questions. You know, you have to be curious and like willing to be lost and willing to sort of admit and actually treasure that you, you have to treasure what you don't know and you have to treasure that you don't know. And that's one of the dangers, I think, uh, or sorrows, I should say, of school is that we're, we're constantly rewarding and valorizing and like mandating knowing, but we don't celebrate the reason that we're actually gathered at all, which is because we don't know, you know? And in a way it's like the coolest thing about school to me is when we like sweetly tend to our unknowing, we get together and we're like, ah, oh, oh, you too don't know? What are you trying to do? <laughs> you know? And like love each other for that and not because of what you know, but because you're willing to come with what you don't know, you know? Um, 
Yeah. So anyway, I agree with you on that. On that. When, again, I, when I was reading that chapter or that essay, I was thinking of the library and how the library kind of fills that for adults after school, yeah. right? Because yeah, we come yeah. together to continue to learn and uh, and you never know what you don't know until you learn that you don't know it, right? And that whole just, there's always something to learn. There's always a way to fill in a new gap that you didn't even know yeah. existed. And so- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I just think like the communal aspect of college too, like okay. I wish that was more outside of college because it's like one thing to be an autodidact and just absorb knowledge. But if you're not like sharing and like, like you have to like learn what you don't know and things. And I think like that's what happens sometimes is like, like when you like people like don't like people that might like, they see college as just filling us with facts, but really my benefit from college was being around other people that didn't know anything. Like totally. it's just like, yeah. And it's like, I was able to process these ideas and things. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I'll stop. I'm going to send you a TikTok. I mean, <laughs> Cause I just I mean, saw TikTok they, about it. <laughs> there's a there's a um well, what you're saying is like well, I think one of the most important things or the most important thing about college is that it's like a place where we can be together you know yeah it's like beyond that I mean there's all these sort of material things like maybe you'll get a degree that maybe I'll help you get a job maybe you'll go into a hundred thousand dollars of debt that you'll never actually pay off and you'll be you know um so it's like you know it's complicated but there is a thing that seems mostly the case Though sometimes you have to really sort of advocate to have it happen, which is that you get to hang out. And hanging out is kind of where it's at, you know? There's a beautiful yeah. quote, I'd love to say it, I'll never stop saying it. And it's from um, a writer named Fred Moten. And he he was talking about a very difficult book that he was teaching in his class. And he realized from teaching this very difficult book that it would be impossible to read the book without being in a group together, trying to work on it together. And he says, we gotta get together to figure out how to get together. That's, but that's yeah. not super efficient, is it? <laughs> never efficient. It's never efficient. Never efficient. So, <laughs> man, it's just like they're at war with each other. I keep thinking, I'm going back to that every time. And I'm like, but that's not, but then there's no care. I get it. Oh, man. This is I mean, the like best a thing about a library. Session. The best thing about a library is how inefficient it is to me. Like the coolest thing about a library is browsing. That old thing. That old, remember that browsing? <laughs> yeah. There's nothing cooler than going to the library with nothing to do you're not looking for i mean it's great it's awesome to go because you know you have a thing you got to figure out how to like do your countertops and you go in there and you get your book and you do it or you got to like write your paper you do this and that or you but like there's something it encourages and invites the best libraries walking through the stacks and just being like oh that's a cool title <laughs> let me read let me look at that boring that's a cool <laughs> let me look at that whoa you know that's it is so inefficient. The thing is, I don't know if this is just me, but like we don't do that outside. I mean, you once you start working in a library, because I used to do that a lot, would just hang out at the library, but you don't do that when you work here because you don't because you're like you value yeah. your time off, which yeah, you sure. could be here, but it's like it also sure. confuses regulars. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> are you working here? Like I just put on like a like a very like offensive heavy metal shirt so they know I'm not working. <laughs> That's awesome. But I feel that with thrift stores. That's what I do because, like, and my brother is like very profit. Like, my brother's a very businessy guy, and so he'll be like, he goes to thrift stores, and he's like, he thinks I'm only doing it because we have like a like an antique booth, and I'm like, no, this is a museum you can touch. Oh, like, yeah. like oh, you yeah. can like I absorb like I get to like browse and like what was this for? Like, what was this? Like, it's not about oh, like yeah. and like that's, there's a lot of joy in going to thrift stores for me. That oh, yeah. I feel is because I work at a library. I, I can't do it at the library anymore. I gotta yeah, go to yeah, other yeah. places. <laughs> get my fix, so. great. And I hate to be a doubter, but like it just it drives me insane. I, I can't do thrift stores because I'm like, I can't browse it and know what I'm going for and go in and get it and then leave and go on yeah. with my next chore. Like there's always something that I have to go do next. Yeah. That I don't give myself the ability to just exist. Mm -hmm. So let's go on to the next question. I was just like, what's your lunch break? Do you have an itemized lunch break? Like, <laughs> no, I don't that, think I go home and I walk my dog. You got to block that out. You got to be like, this hour is a free hour, just like they did in kindergarten. I, <laughs> I mean, an hour. I also, I also am like, um, 
you know, maybe should be paid more and have more time off. That's actually what I think. <laughs> We'll, you know. we'll make sure that we take that as a clip and put it out. <laughs> put that on. Like, <laughs> oh, hey, city By manager and leadership. Um, yeah. You heard it from Ross Gay. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So we'll move on from this. Um, let's go back to the music, though, because you do reference, and not even in just the Unlikely Covers chapter, a lot of different musicians throughout. Um, so, and because poetry is also your thing and songwriting is poetry in a way. Um, does music inspire your writing? Totally. I mean, even like in that instance, in the instances of the book, I'm often thinking about music. Um, yeah, I'm often thinking about music. So that's a way that inspires my writing, you know. Do you play music? What's that? Do you play music? Like play the music? Do you music? play an instrument? I played yeah. the saxophone when I was a child. Um, okay. So. Yeah, and I like to sing. Okay. Uh, but I, um, I also was really like when I was a kid, I wasn't reading books too much. I was, but I was deep into music, and I was really reading lyrics, song lyrics. So I feel like that's really um, influential in how I, in ways that I can't, could never like articulate. But I know that some of the most important sort of uh words text that i was reading when i was a kid was you know tracy chapman and public enemy and de la soul and uh you know uh, with simon garfunkel and you know on and on and on so it besides the fact of just like loving music you know well i think there's a lot of poetry in music yeah so absolutely. it makes sense that we would find it in your in your writing, I guess. Yeah. I uh yeah, I you said public enemy and I thought about like when I first got my like the film program I, I took like the first movie for intro was Do the Right Thing and we spent a lot of time talking about public enemy and how it played into the thing and like yeah yeah just like how much like in screenwriting, they always tell you, like, don't put the songs because you don't know if you can afford them or whatever. But then okay. I was recently told, like, that that's actually bad advice that, like, you should because if that's part of you, if that song is, like, part of your narrative, like, put it in it. And, like, if it comes to it, like, if you're making the movie and maybe, like, don't let that rule of don't put names of songs that you're, like, writing in to your yes. screenplay because you don't know if you can afford them. They said, like, I was, they, they said that that can structure reading, writing. Like that's yeah. like saying like, cause that song's a part of your thought. You think that song works. So it's like yeah, recently yeah. I'm breaking that rule for me when I'm writing. And mm. so. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so. Nice. But they can just reference the song rather than like playing the song in the movie if yeah. it doesn't work out. That's a good point. You can always get like a <laughs> cover. You can always play 30 <laughs> seconds of it. There's other rules yeah. around it. So. Fair yeah. use. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Well, thank you for thank dealing you. with yeah. us and our therapy session um, <laughs> oh for this episode. But um, this is our first episode of the season. And yeah. so um, rather than um, do how we've been treating our book recommendations, we're going to ask our guests to recommend oh. books for our listeners. And so we would love if you could maybe give us three books that either you absolutely love or things that you've read recently that you would recommend, anything. You can take it in yeah. any direction you want. Yeah, so three books, and they're right in front of me, actually, on this little table. There's a book called Chrome Valley by Mahogany Brown, and that's poems. And then there's a book called Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, and that's by Norman Finkelstein. Okay. And then there's another book of poems called Revolutionary Letters by Diane DePrima. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so Thank much. You so we'll much. definitely include those in our show notes and put yeah. them in the record set that folks can access on our catalog. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? What do you got going on? Like what's, uh, well, you know what, what are you doing for the rest of the day? That's a good, <laughs> yeah, what's that for you today? I'm gonna write a couple letters of recommendation. I'm gonna um, procrastinate. Mm. I'm gonna exercise. I might cook some chili. We have a friend <laughs> who's having uh, like a little medical procedure, so. We need to drop some chili off. Um, those are probably the main things on the books. And you make vegetarian chili, right? You're a vegetarian. Do you say that I in the do. book? I do. So yeah. what do you, I also uh, don't eat meat. What do you put in your yeah. chili? Are you a beans yeah. person? Do you use the meat? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, no, 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 beans. Um, I might use like tempeh. I might use tempeh. Okay. Um, probably not in this one. We have some really good, beautiful. Um, I think they're scarlet runner beans and some lentils. Oh, are y'all homegrown? The, no, they're not. Okay. But it's funny okay. because we grew scarlet runner beans this year and just shelled them. But these are actually some from that we bought. Um, okay. But yeah, and uh, onion, pepper, carrots, um, greens, probably from the garden, kale and stuff from the garden. And uh, we got some escarole from a local farmer we'll throw in there. Can't wait. Making me hungry already. And our tomato. <laughs> Tomatoes that we can from last summer. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Well, that's way better than my chili, I think. I don't like good <laughs> chili. So I believe uh, it. I believe it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today yeah, and um and helping us think. Yeah. Like big thoughts yeah. that I think I still have to go and like process after this interview because my brain is still working. It's like yeah. Um, I I enjoyed this. This is a fun interview and reading your stuff is, it reminds me of like my old like college days and things. And I enjoy it a that's lot. That's so. not good. I'm definitely re recommending your book to Pete, my, some of my friends. Well, and uh, for our listeners, Inciting Joy, we've got the Book of Delights, the Book of More Delights, um, and several others that we will definitely link to uh, for that Ross has written. So Awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you yeah. again. So fun talking to you. Thank have, you. have a good day. Oh my god, that was a great interview. First official episode in the books. It was, yeah. And you know what? We're going to have way more more fun this season. I don't know if we said that in the last episode, but I, I mean, it, but some of the people we're trying to reach out to, I'm really hoping we can get some awesome interviews. So We already Fingers know crossed. we're going to get awesome interviews. We just don't always know who it's going to be just yet. Yeah, so. Uh, but yeah. We're going to have fun this season, so definitely stick around. Uh, let us know what you guys think of these yeah. episodes. Yeah, in get down in the comments and let us know, because if you want, we know we're trying out different formats this year, so just, yeah, if you like them, let us know. If you don't, let us know. That's, you know. Although, be nice about it. <laughs> I have a like, very, like, low tolerance for hate. Yeah, and also just, like, limit the gifts, because I, I can't, like, this is still my job, so, like, I can't, you know, when I get customer feedback. Limit though. I can't put a GIF in my like customer feedback. It's true. So you like that person shared GIF of <laughs> <laughs> a very sad looking dog for so I don't I know don't. what that means. I can't, you know, like I can't be <laughs> what am I supposed to do with my hand? I would love right to see that report. We have plenty of sad crying dogs <laughs> uh, as a feedback from this episode. No, don't do that. Yeah. Give us good feedback. Yeah. It was constructive feedback. Um, and just have fun with us. This yeah, we, yeah, I'm like, yeah, it's gonna be a great time. All right, yeah, let's get to credits. See you guys later. Peace. A list of the books discussed in today's episode can be found in the accompanying show notes. To request any of the books heard about in today's episode, visit wichitalibrary.org or call us at 316 261 8500. Thank you to Ross Gay for joining us for today's recording. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to our production crew and podcast team. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, visit wichitalibrary.org slash readict. Stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. To join the group, search hashtag ReadICT Challenge on Facebook and click join. And don't forget to log your books into the reading tracker at Beanstack. Each month you log a book in the challenge, you're eligible to win fun prizes. If you need any assistance signing up or logging books, give us a call, reach us on chat, or stop by your nearest branch. You can follow this podcast on the Spotify app or stream episodes on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe and share with all your friends. Bye! Bye.